Wisconsin against Yoder and others. Mr. Calhoun. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Respondents here are members of the Old Order Amish religious sect. They reside in Greene County, southwestern Wisconsin. In November of 1968, when they refused to send their children beyond the eighth grade, a summons and criminal complaint was filed in the county court of Greene County. They were tried on April 2, 1969, for violation of the Wisconsin Compulsory School Attendance Law. The case was tried to the county court of Greene County, and the respondents were found guilty there. They had a trial de novo in the circuit court of Greene County, where the court again found them guilty and imposed a minimum fine of $5 on each of the respondents. They appealed to the Wisconsin Supreme Court. The Wisconsin Supreme Court reversed, and this court granted certiorari on May 24th of this year. Respondents object to education of the children in public, private, secular, or non-secular schools beyond a certain point. Present time, the objection is eighth grade. The trial court noted the problem of the arbitrary eighth grade cutoff in its decision. Now, a word about the decisions and opinions that were filed in this case in the courts below. The trial court below found that the compulsory school attendance law did interfere with the freedom of the respondents to act in support of their religious beliefs. They also found that appreciable numbers of the Amish reared youth do leave the faith. Both the trial courts concluded after careful consideration of the cases that the compulsory school attendance laws in Wisconsin were a reasonable exercise of the police power of the state to educate its youth. The state law requires attendance at school through a certain age? Yes, that's through a certain age. Sixteen? Yes, seven through sixteen. This is pretty general throughout the rest of the state. It's based on age and not on grade. That would mean, would it not, that if you had a remarkable or unusual child who began school when he was four and whose parents wanted to take him out to pursue his own studies at a point, he'd still have to go to school formally until he was 16. If he could show achievement equivalent to a high school education at any point, he would be excused from the compulsory school attendance laws. So the achievement test is interposed on the arbitrary 16? Yes, there is an area of discretion there to be exercised by the state superintendent of public instruction, Your Honor. And this provides for certain unusual cases. And, of course, there are exemptions for health problems and handicaps and that sort of thing. But there's no problem with respect to the substantial equivalency of education, the discretion resting with the state superintendent of public instruction. Now, the opinions of the Wisconsin court were three in number. There was the principal opinion, which stated, page 133 of the appendix, we view this case as involving solely a parent's right of religious freedom to bring up his children as he believed God dictates. If nothing else than that God dictates in an infinite variety of ways, this makes for a fairly broad issue. The concurring opinion states, 
and it stated this, under the facts of this case, there has been an inadequate showing that the state's interest in establishing and maintaining an educational system overrides the defendant's right to the free exercise of his religion. What happens in Wisconsin under your statute if, uh, if uh, a person age under 16 wants to uh, go off into a vocational school? We have a vocational school uh, situation in uh, the law, Your Honor, which... Uh, that's considered... Yes. That, that's meeting it. Yes, it's uh, a, a rather elaborate system of, of uh, vocational schools in Wisconsin, and there is a provision uh, specifically for children to attend a vocational school if that vocational school is in the school, within the school district. And uh, this, the trial court asked the same question in this area and was satisfied that the vocational school <coughs> law probably had no particular application in this, in this case, although vocational schools are certainly open and available to all uh, people in Wisconsin. Generally, what's the range of of training in a vocational school? Uh, the uh, range is, is very broad. Now, uh, the, the, ag the agricultural vocational uh, school, which would probably interest the Amish more, is handled through the uh, uh, land grant, the, the old uh, federal uh, aid uh, program to agricultural uh, uh, education. And that's handled in the high school. There's a special agricultural teacher who is paid out of federal funds. And uh, that has been in existence for a long time. Uh, so that is available. There isn't any question that these, these vocational uh, uh, programs are available to respondents. Do the uh, images have private schools? Do they have private schools? Yes. In, uh, in many areas, they do. And uh, in this particular instance, however, they apparently uh, refused to set up any school <coughs> which uh, uh, goes beyond the eighth grade. There are no, no secondary schools uh, in operation by the Amish in, uh, in Wisconsin that I know of. There may be uh, some who are, uh, are, haven't been uh, approved by the state superintendent but are still in operation. Mr. Calhoun, was there yes. any element of retaliation in this case? I, I think there was not, uh, uh, Mr. Justice Blackman. There was absolutely no uh, evidence of, of that. And, uh, in fact, uh, this has been a rather uh, intelligently and studiously tried case from the beginning. There is a good, uh, there, there are statements in the record of, of expert witnesses in favor of, speaking in favor of the Amish, there's been no rancor, and it's been a uh, most interesting uh, case because it has been free of that type of thing. And yet it was triggered by the loss of state aid. Well, uh, I, yes, there is a loss of state aid, but that is really insignificant to the uh, issues involved. I don't think that uh, that has uh, really anything to do about it. State aids are very small compared to the real need uh, of the school district. Now, well, I gather the issue here, though, is not whether the children must go to school, is it? Rather, is it the issue whether the parents yes. must see to it that the children Yes, it isn't, it isn't a question of truancy here. It's a question of whether the parents can be compelled to send their children to school. And I take it uh, that it's really a limited issue, constitutionally at least, whether their uh, freedom of religion is, well, is violated yes, by requiring yeah, them to send their children. We think, there, we think there are two issues here, really. First of all, is whether the, the uh, let me uh, state it, whether or not the respondents may select the time the extent, and whether or not they will comply with the compulsory school attendance laws, and whether there is, somewhat more broadly stated, a constitutional right 
to conscientiously object to uh, education. Yes, but uh, as, I, as I get it, so I, uh, am I wrong? We're not concerned here with whether the children have to go to school, Amish or not. We're concerned with whether Amish parents can be compelled under the threat of uh, criminal punishment. Well, of course, we're concerned about the rights of the child to an education. I think we're concerned about that. I don't think we can avoid that as a as a uh, an overriding issue, and I think the dissenting opinion expressed that well, because the the compelling interest of the state is in the education of the children, and the the interest of the child in education is important. It's vital, and this is the uh, this is what we think the. Uh, the real issues are. No. Well, maybe Ken Allen is true in Wisconsin and in other states that the way to get to the fact that the child is not in school is to get the parents. Isn't that the normal procedure? What was that mean? Is to, is to. If I, if I say I will not send my child to public school, I'm the one that's going to court. Isn't that that's the right. normal procedure? That's right, yes. And isn't this just as normal as any other case? Yes. Uh, well, uh, that's right. It's it's a it's a question of uh, whether or not they uh, uh, complied with the law. Uh, in this yes, but doesn't the state have to show a compelling interest in this one? Yes, we think there's a compelling interest in education. But, well, is, is it enough that it's a compelling interest in education, or does it have to be uh, uh, some other kind of compelling interest? No, I don't think there has to be any other kind of compelling interest because it is through, through compulsory education, compulsory school attendance, that the the interest is implemented. The interest, the subject to be regulated, is education. Well, I, I, I don't see how anyone could question that the state has a compelling interest in education. Yes. But, but you think that answers the... Well, I don't think it answers the question completely, no. I don't think it answers the question completely. It has to have a compelling interest in total compliance, doesn't it? Not to demonstrate that? Uh, no, I don't think it, I don't think that the, the compelling interest is not in total compliance uh, necessarily. The question is whether or not uh, the court can say that the Amish parents have a constitutional right to conscientiously object to education, to sending their children to school. Well, you don't, you don't, you don't, uh, does the state challenge uh, that this is, uh, their position about education is warp and whoop of their religion? Uh, what we have said in that is, is simply this, that uh, as the trial court has said, it interferes with their freedom to act, but not with their religious belief as such, and that the cases are clear, and this court has pronounced time and again, that the freedom uh, to act may be restricted in interpretation of the First Amendment, but the freedom to believe may not. Uh, you mean the old polygamy cases? That's right. The old, the old Mormon cases, Cantwell we versus Connecticut. Is that what we have here? Yes. Yes. It's as simple. It's as simple as that. We decided that way. I wish it were. I don't find it that. Simple. What we're saying here is essentially <clears throat> that there is a compelling interest in education. That's, that's essentially our view, and that <clears throat> this court and the Congress, the people of this country have manifested this compelling interest. Well, the concurring really opinion. Don't see how anyone can challenge that. That's right. I don't either. But, but, but Your Honor, and this is what we find wrong. This is why we're here. Is because this is what. They said, under the facts of this case, there has been an inadequate showing that the state's interest in establishing and maintaining an educational system overrides the defendant's right to the free exercise of religion. It's just as clear as that. It's as clear as the conscientious objector cases. It's as clear as the statement in Gillette. It's as clear as Welch and Seeger. I don't want to equate, I don't want to equate military uh, rule and or imply by equating compulsory education with military conscription 
that the heavy hand of the state is being applied here. It's quite the contrary. The compulsory school attendance laws have been in existence for years. They were part of the established church when this country was founded, when the colonists established uh, the theocratic uh, societies in the pre-revolutionary days. When the church became disestablished, the compulsory school attendance laws remained. They remained in a democratic fashion, and they are applied and enacted in a democratic fashion. When you talk about Sherbert against Vernon, which is the case in which these, uh, which the respondents rely, you have an entirely different set of values. You're not talking in Sherbert against Werner about a social institution of the type of education, military conscription, the, uh, the system of taxation, all of these other things where the legislature acts to grant the exemption. This is a positive force that we're dealing with for the benefit of society. And it is the legislature that should determine in its own area of protection of the liberties of this country. It is the legislature that should determine whether the compulsory school attendance laws are necessary to enact or to obtain the full benefit of education to the individual and society. At this point, I think we get to a, a, a important area for this court to consider. Uh, I'm sure that you're aware of, of Justice Frankfurter's uh, opinion in Minersville legal Bibles and in his dissent in West Virginia against Barnett. In these particular cases, he espoused the importance of the legislature, and it is in this particular area, in the area of education, where we are talking in terms of positive movement of more education and not less, we have that, other, the, that the legislature uh, has an important function. We have other cases, of course, as you well know, where the power and the duty of the state to support education comes into collision with the uh, religion clauses of the First Amendment, and isn't that what we have here? Well, in, in a what, different what, form. In what cases particular do you have in mind? Well, the recent cases that were decided uh, where states were giving support to All right. private schools. Yes, yes I think that's that, right. That, that state action... Uh, uh, was thought all right. to uh, be in conflict with the First Amendment. No, I, I think that what yes, I think I think what the court is is uh, uh, I think what we're doing is opening up a little a different approach to the same argument. We'll arrive at the same uh, same conclusion uh, as I think uh, Justice uh, uh, White said. It's our good fortune in Lemon v. Kurtzman that the states have undertaken to educate our youth and to compel their attendance at schools by compulsory school attendance. Now, what we're concerned about here uh, takes us to Pierce against the Society of Sisters of the Holy Name, where the court said that we couldn't compel attendance at public schools, but there was no reason why attendance could not be compelled at public or private, secular or non-secular schools. And this is the area, uh, when you talk about aid to parochial education, uh, that we get into. We get into a proposition that, uh, that endeavors to augment this. Uh, and that is not really the question here. The question here is education or no education. It's not the question of private education or public education or how much one should be aided over the other. Yes, there is a First Amendment uh, question, but it's an establishment question rather than a freedom to worship question. I, I take it if, uh, I think you said earlier, uh, perhaps to Mr. Justice Douglas, 
that uh, the Amish do have their own school. Yes. And I take it it's like uh, Roman Catholic protein school or any other protein school. The standards of education in those schools met state standards. You wouldn't be here, would you? That's right. We would not. And it, it is that they will not comply with the state quality standards. Is that but, yes, they won't. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, that, that's correct. Yes, they they have no no schools. They have no schools. If the Amish could show. Uh, they haven't done so in this case, I take it. Uh, but if they could show that their own training in agriculture brought their children at age 16 to the same point or a higher point of achievement as compared with those who went to the vocational schools to learn about agriculture, would you uh, be here then? Well, uh, I'm not sure, because I'm not sure whether... Uh, that would would uh, meet the standard. We probably wouldn't be here. We might be in some other uh, lower uh, court determining whether there was a reasonable uh, uh, ruling uh, by the uh, administrative bodies, uh, such as Department of Public Instruction, who are experts in this in this area. Uh, but it would not be the same constitutional question that's involved here. That, I, I think it's safe to say, but we would not be here. Now, incidentally, does, 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 do the Amish have any uh, formal schools in Wisconsin? So? Do the Amish? Yes. Uh, yes, I think there are some. There are some grade schools. Uh, uh, they were, and I believe they were establishing a grade school in the. Uh, uh, Green County area. I'm not sure of that, but I know there are some schools that are established up in uh, up in the uh, Medford area in the northern part of the state. Is the quality of education in those schools uh, satisfy state standards? I believe that those schools do satisfy state standards, although uh, it may be that the, the, again, the superintendent hasn't made a ruling on it. Uh, Mr. Now, I've indicated that that uh, the compulsory school attendance law and the ruling of this uh, of the Wisconsin courts more properly analyzed in terms of the conscientious objector cases, Welch, Seeger, and Gillette. And to this extent, the the ruling of the Wisconsin court does present uh, a constitutional right to anyone who has a conscientious objection based on a sincere moral belief to object to education. And we submit that this <clears throat> would raise havoc with the educational system, not only in Wisconsin, but throughout the country. Now, let's look at the specific laws, uh, for example. <clears throat> there is a correlation expressed in Prince against Massachusetts, a correlation, for example, between compulsory education and compulsory school attendance and the child labor laws. They are integrated. We quoted the, chi the uh, child labor laws to uh, show that in our brief. Now, not only is there a correlation there, but there must be a correlation in the whole program, the whole legislative program uh, regarding children, the manner in which a juvenile judge, for example, deals with a dependent child would be affected by the decision of this court. And if it were to say that there is a constitutional right to conscientiously object to education, I feel that would be removing a vital tool from the administration of the law as it relates to youth and children. I'll reserve the rest of my time, Your Honor, for rebuttal. Very well, Mr. Calhoun. Mr. Calhoun, would your case be any different if instead of age 16, it were age 21? Uh, that question was asked last night. Uh, no, I, I, I think then we've got into the area of reasonableness, Your Honor, and uh, 
again, uh, the line is drawn somewhere, and it's reached by uh, a, a basis that is not arbitrary, and I assume this is done in the legislative uh, halls and in the uh, testimony of witnesses in, who are experts in education before various committees. Age 21 would not be a, uh, a particularly advisable area, whether in terms of education uh, today, uh, this is reasonable, would probably have to be determined by the court. Uh, it would not seem to me to be. But I don't think the principle, the underlying principle, is, is uh, much different. Uh, in other words, it's a matter of legislative uh, administrative concern. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court. The Wisconsin Attorney General's attempt to have these Amish parents found criminally guilty has now entered its fourth year. And this in spite of the fact that in January of this year, the Supreme Court of his state, by a six to one vote, came to two conclusions. And I'm quoting now from the concurring opinion that there has been an inadequate showing that the state's interest in establishing and maintaining an educational system overrides the defendant's right to the free exercise of religion. And secondly, that Amish should not be required to attend a school which meets the requirements of state law beyond the eighth grade. And even the one dissenting opinion, that of Mr. Justice Heffern, talked about how these prosecution came to be triggered that there's strong evidence that the purpose of this prosecution was not to further the compelling interest of the state in education, but rather the reprehensible objective, under the facts of this case, to force the Amish into school only for the purpose of qualifying for augmented state aids. I'm going to tax the court by going over just a little bit some of the facts as they have been presented, because I think they're basic uh, from hearing the questions that have been asked. The legal basis for this prosecution is the refusal of these parents on religious grounds to afford the three children in question at most two years of high school under a statute which requires not a high school course, not four years of high schooling, not even one year necessarily, but merely school through age 15, not through age 16, through age 15, according to the statute. <coughs> Now, the state interest becomes a little bit varied when we think in terms of compelling state interest because if there is a VO school, a technical school, a vocational school in the school district, then the age limit is 18, up to 18, the child must attend. A different standard applies where there is no VO school, and the record in this case establishes uh, that there was no, uh, no vocational school in this district. Now then, in terms of the interest that the state has in trying to compel these children to attend school beyond the eighth grade, we have to realize that for Frida Yoder, the daughter of Jonas Yoder, one of the three children in question, only one year of schooling was involved because she was 15 years and five months old on the day the criminal complaint was brought against her father. Barbara Miller would have only six months of this state benefit of com additional compulsory education because she was 15 years and eight months old at the time the criminal complaint was brought. Now, is the position of the Amish parents that the application of the statute to them violates their free exercise of religion and that there has been no showing whatever, no showing at all, that non-application of the statute to them violates or, 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 or creates any substantial danger to any interest of the state of Wisconsin. Nobody on our side challenges the fact that the compulsory attendance laws bespeak a compelling state interest. We have merely, in fact, emphasized in this case and in our defense of this, our whole soul support as a statement of this court in Brown versus the Board of Education, wherein the court said education is a principal instrument in awakening the child's cultural values and preparing him for later professional training and in helping him to adjust normally to his environment. 
This is a superb description of what the Amish people believe in in terms of education. My argument, may it please the court, will pursue two points. One, the free exercise claim, and secondly, the question of danger to interests of the state which the state of Wisconsin has said exists in so substantial a degree. The free exercise point is extremely important. That is, it's extremely important that I try to develop this at some length, because here we're not talking about one tenet of a religion being at stake. For example, observance of the Sabbath or opposition to military training. Uh, we're not talking here about one particular practice say, spreading of the gospel through speech or press or assembly, as has appeared in a number of cases. We're not talking about one forced exercise, such as the salute to a graven image or recitation of prayers or Bible reading. But we're talking about a whole complex of religious interests, religious interests and in rights in education, in worship, in parental nurture, in individual religious choice, in vocation, in communal association, with respect to teaching and learning, and with respect to privacy, as we have tried to spell out in our brief. And indeed, we're talking about, as will appear, the continued existence of the Amish faith community in the United States. In Garber versus Kansas, Kansas versus Garber, rather, the, the only other state Supreme Court decision in point, very scant attention was paid to the actualities of the Amish religious claim. And therefore, we're dwelling on that to some extent here this morning. The Amish uh, are in what, about a dozen or 15 states of the Union? Something yes, like about 15, uh, Mr. Justice Stewart. And is it uh, about 50,000 people? And each uh, Amish community is uh, unique in a way, isn't it? Each, they, there are local variations among them, are there not? And among their. There are slight variations among them. I would say the Old Order Amish are fairly uniform, whether you find them in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, or whether you find them in New Glarus, Wisconsin. Uh, they're very much the same. They follow the same practices and have the same attitudes toward religion, education, children, the simple life, and so on. Same basic life style. Yes, sir. Yes, dictated by their religious beliefs. Yes, sir. And we're talking, in this case, about the Old Order Amish. Is this... Uh, is it only the old order Amish so called who are who object to a formal education? Of old the order Amish? Amish and old order Mennonite and some variants of these same groups which are nevertheless basically the same. They have a common all element have the same in uh, the Anabaptists, as I understand. Yes, it. that is correct. And uh, these particular people go back to Switzerland in the what they do. 16th century? They go back to a time in the sixteenth century, Mr. Justice Stewart, when a number of people of the Protestant Reformation sought to return to what they believed to be the golden age of Christianity, in the early centuries of Christianity, and reject the institutional churches of the Catholic Church and the other Protestant churches. And to do this, and to have that life, they believed that their lives had to be governed completely by the Sermon on the Mount. And this would be, therefore, the meaning of the, the the call for the creating of a community of love, of mutual help, of simplicity, closeness to nature, animals, soil, plants, and so on, turning the other cheek, and extremely importantly, uh, perhaps the most critical point in the understanding of the Amish religion, separation from the world, which they believed was not only the practical means whereby this life could be lived, but was also a means, a, a principle, and joined upon them by the Gospels themselves, where St. Paul speaks, uh, as say, st says, do not be conformed to this world. This is a basic doctrine of Amish religious teaching. And so therefore, they in two ways have sought to separate themselves from the world and have maintained this over the centuries. First of all, they see that there has to be a separation from what they consider pride of intellect, that is to say the higher learning as they express it. They believe that education's aim should be the life of goodness, not the life of the intellect, the making of a good man, not the making of the good American life. They believe that this life of goodness rejects the world of technical cunning and instead embraces wisdom. 
They believe that life is a very short pilgrimage and that its whole purpose is to get human beings to their salvation in the arms of God. A question was posed, a very enlightening question was posed upon the trial by the Deputy Attorney General assigned to the Department of Education in Wisconsin. He said to Professor John Hostetler, who was an expert witness on the side of the defense, and who was the world's foremost authority on the Amish people, he asked Dr. Hostetler, isn't it the point of education to help a person to get ahead in the world? And Dr. Hostetler superbly replied, it depends on which word, later explaining that, of course, what he meant was that the aim of, the, of education, as far as the Amish are concerned, is to get to heaven. Therefore, they reject what many of the rest of us accept in the world of knowledge, and they believe that the education in writing and reading and arithmetic which a child can acquire up until the time of adolescence is sufficient education, particularly in view of the fact that Amish life is, is not concerned with technical technical uh, and technological achievement and development. Now, Dr. Hostetler uh, grew up uh, in an Amish community, and he's a Ph.D. That is correct. How, how is that to be explained? It shows that he left the Amish faith. It shows that people can leave the Amish faith, and that the fact that they began in life as Amish children is not necessarily a crippling experience. He later elected to, to leave the Amish faith, and this is done in, in the Amish faith, at the time of adult baptism, at that time, a child or a young man or woman must face up to the fact of whether he wishes to live the Amish life or not. And he may refuse to live the Amish life if he wishes to. Some do. There are no wholesale departures from the ranks of the Amish people. I think that we've brought out in our brief and in Dr. Hostetler's many works on this subject, it has shown that while there is a, a some attrition, the community has continued in pretty much the same size over the years. Well, this first rejection, then, is rejection of the world of intellect, and the second... Is, is, there, is there a belief in elementary education or just an acceptance of it? I'm talking about education through the eighth grade, learning to spell and to, and decipher. And well, they believe that those, those, right. those basic skills are, are sound and desirable for a child to have. They're quite aware of their, their citizenship. They believe that a person should be able to read and write and communicate. So there's, there's more than just an acquiescence in that. There's a, an affirmative acceptance. Yes, there's an affirmative that. acceptance of education to that point. Mr. Ball, I take it then if a, uh, that among the uh, consistent adherents to the church, there are no professional people, no lawyers, no physicians. That is quite true, Mr. Justice. Unless I come back after yes. education. Yes, yes. That is quite correct. And yet they do rely on, certainly on medical knowledge elsewhere, do they not? Yes, they rely upon medical knowledge. They simply, their point of view is, is not whether medical knowledge is necessarily good for the world. Their point of view is one, it is simply based upon the fact that they believe that they themselves may not pursue the higher learning. This is a point of strict religious belief with these people. But they will seek medical treatment. Yes. yes, they will seek medical treatment. Right now, they are receiving legal help, though they did not seek it. It came to them through the National Committee for Amish Religious Freedom. But they do not, they would far rather suffer, personally, uh, prosecution than make a test case, go into court, and so on. In that connection, is there any, has there been any attempt to compromise the situation as evidently was done in Pennsylvania and Canada? Yes, Mr. Justice Blackman, um, the supplemental appendix sets forth the efforts which we made under a number of provisions of Wisconsin law in which we felt there was some daylight for these people. Uh, we attempted a negotiation for them to avoid having any kind of court case, and uh, these uh, these attempts were rejected out of hand, uh, as I think the supplemental appendix very clearly reveals. The second element of separation is a separation from the ways of the world. The Amish do not want their children, and they do not want themselves to be exposed to the spirit of luxury, of ostentation, of strife, consumerism, competition, speed, violence, other such elements as, as are commonly found in our American life. Therefore, education for them embraces a rejection of the higher learning, 
and a positive emphasis upon learning the learning of the agricultural life. It rejects the concept of, of exposure to and service in the ways of the world. And when you add to this the factor of adolescence, you'll see why an Amish person, whether we would agree with him or not, may not, from a religious point of view, attend school beyond the eighth grade. That factor of adolescence is extremely basic in Amish religious thinking. Uh, it's the time which leads to adult baptism. It's the time of the starting of life's work, meeting challenges and real responsibilities on the part of young people. It's a very sensitive time when values are formed. The Amish religion forbids high school then because of those three elements. There's a tremendous stress on the importance and the opportunity which adolescence creates. Now, if they are placed in school, the record shows that they are going to be, these children are going to be exposed to the social life of the school, be it public, private, or parochial. They are going to be exposed to a curriculum, much of which they must religiously reject, and much of which is superfluous to their intended life as, as growing up in the Amish faith community. Well, one, one of those schools that the uh, Attorney General has said the uh, Amish have established yes, they and have. where they adhere to the state standards in curriculum. Mr. Justice Brennan, those are all elementary schools. The Amish do not maintain any high schools, that's whatever. That's your reading, writing. Oh. Yes, that's correct, Mr. Justice Brennan. Now, when you take a child from Amish life at adolescence and place him in a high school, he is naturally going to be exposed to those values which his parents' religion rejects. He's going to be exposed to those ways of life which, are, which typify high school today. And this alienation, which was abundant testimony in the record, this alienation of the child, who has been raised, as he has a right to be raised, in the Amish faith community up until adolescence, there's no disagreement with that on the part of the state. He has been raised in that atmosphere up until then to be suddenly placed in a high school where there's different dress, different speech, very, very different people with very, very different backgrounds. This is extremely traumatic to the person. And this alienation why, why is psychologically it, damaging to such a person. Why is that so much more traumatic than the eighth grade would be? In the eighth grade, our particular defendants were in parochial schools, Amish parochial schools, until the eighth grade. They tend in eighth grade, they tend up to that time, whether they are in a public or, a, or a, uh, a, uh, an Amish school, to be, in, at least in part, associated with other Amish children. Uh, the Amish place a tremendous importance upon the coming of adolescence. And they believe that it's at that time in one's life when you're heading toward adult baptism and when the whole person is in, a, in a, is in a state of ferment and change, that at that time in your life, the influences of the world can be especially deadly to the Amish child. I think adolescence is a very important part of this whole thinking of the Amish, that in up until the eighth grade, in those earlier years, the, the chance or the, the temptations to, to become a worldly person and the, the imposition of values in another school system may have far less impact than they will to a, a child who is beyond or in adolescence. Do I understand that in this particular community, the elementary schools are more or less regional so that most of the students are armored students or not? Is that what you're saying? The, yes, th this is correct. The, the uh, Amish parochial schools are Amish schools, and the children are... are not here, in this, this county, are they? Yes, they're, 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 in fact, the, it, is, it was understood that this prosecution was triggered by the very fact that, yeah. as the record shows, an Amish 1 to 8th grade school had been started. Yeah, it's been started. I yes. know, but prior to that yeah. time. Now, these prior children... Prior to that time, they went to the regular... Yes, a number of... Many public. Amish children have attended public schools, Mr. Justice Martin. Well, were they mixed in with others, or were they... Yes. Because of locality? The pattern varies. The pattern varies. In some right. cases, they have been mixed in with others, and in some, there have been a, perhaps a majority of Amish children in the school. But on the high school level, there would be a broader mix, obviously. At the high school level, there would be a very much broader mix. And at the time of high school, the child is then, in the Amish religion, being prepared for a, a, a complete 
vocation in Amish life. And this is extremely disruptive to that vocation. And secondly, it is a time in life when exposure to these elements are going to have a very serious impact upon his values. He will have been raised, in, even in the eighth grade, in the eight years, essentially in an Amish community. And the involvement in high school with its social life and everything else is going to be destructive of his faith. From a religious point of view, uh, uh, is this uh, elementary education approach uh, somewhat like the, that of the Jewish faith with the, uh, I think it's age 13, when a, a Jewish child is considered to have become a mature adult? Yes. Is there an analogy between the Amish attitude and that of the I think it was quite a close analogy, uh, Mr. Chief Justice Berger. And I think that's well brought out, by the way, in the brief of the brief amicus curiae in this case by the Synagogue Council of America and other related Jewish groups. The, I would like to come, if I may, in the time that remains, discuss the danger to the state which the state has said it is faced with. If these Amish children, for religious reasons, are permitted to not attend school through age 15. One has to ask whether the state, with its very ample legal research resources, why they never placed a single witness on the stand, produced any documentary evidence at all, one scrap of any study, which would give color to the charge that Amish non-attendance threatens some compelling state interest. All the evidence on that point of compelling state interest came from the defense. The state offered really two points. First of all, that Amish non-attendance two years, one year, six months, whatever it might be, threatens, of all things, the states establishing and maintaining an educational system. Six judges below the Wisconsin Supreme Court denied this fact. Certainly here there's no danger of fraud. Very few people could show what the Amish have shown, that is to say, a unique and ancient religious tradition and religious claim that the the, the obvious nurture and protection of children, which takes place in the Amish community, which treasures children, the whole factor of training in life for a useful and productive vocation, and no casting of the children upon the community. Certainly here there is far less danger of fraud or disturbance of a, of a system than was found in Sherbert versus Vernon. No one else's rights are harmed by virtue of, of Amish non-attendance. And here I'm reminded of the statement of Mr. Justice Brennan in dissent in Brownfeld when he said that values of the First Amendment look primarily toward preservation of personal liberty rather than toward fulfillment of collective goals. Here you have precisely that put into scope. The collective goal is not going to be disturbed by the fact that these children do not attend school. Additionally to that, I have to reinforce what Mr. Calhoun said a few moments ago when he quoted to the court the findings of the trial court, the finding of the circuit court, and the determination by the state Supreme Court that the free exercise of the Amish religion was patently here involved, that the, that the, that the state's action and forcing these children into high school constitute a denial of the free exercise of religion. This, I think, is established in the case, irrespective of what may be thought of the Amish religion. The remaining question then becomes one of a compelling state interest, which means what is the danger to the state, and certainly it is not, in the general enforcement or maintenance of an educational system. Now, does it deny the child free choice? Does it deny the child, as the state says, his right to an education. There's a national consensus that we have cited in our brief at page 32 to this effect that there is no compelling state interest reflected in state compulsory attendance laws in having children attend school beyond the 15th birthday. And this seems to be, if this is the case in state after state after state, that the state doesn't feel 
that a child needs to attend school beyond 15, then it seems to me that, that these children in question do not present in terms of their own rights to an education any danger to any compelling state interest. We have produced in evidence, cited in our brief, this study, which was by Professor John Hostetler under a commission from the U.S. Office of Education, of achievements of Amish children in standardized testing, and it reveals that they perform well. The state has referred to Prince versus Massachusetts in its argument on behalf of parents' patriae. But we have been able to show, I think, quite clearly that there is no such danger to these children as was involved in the Prince case, which, which, whose facts were that of a child hawking a religious magazine at night in streets. Amish life is a, is a garden of nurture of children. The, um, certainly the Attorney General is not telling us that the child labor laws in Wisconsin are not enforced. And certainly, therefore, if there is any need for protection in that direction, the state of Wisconsin is very able to, to afford that protection. The state has talked loosely about the disease of ignorance and opening the gateways of opportunity to these children. But we introduce positive evidence which shows that, that, that Amish education produces good people. We cited the testimony of Dr. Erickson, of the University of, of Chicago when we specifically asked him questions concerning Amish education, which he had very carefully studied, and his comment was this. The Amish definitely provide for their children of high school age what could be called an education. Remember, this was uncontroverted by anything the state chose to put in the record. I would be inclined to say that they do a better job of this than most of the rest of us do. The Amish are in a fortunate position respecting the schooling which they conduct for children beyond the eighth grade. It is learning by doing an ideal system. We are learning that current education is detached from the real world and that in the things they talk about, pupils do not become involved or have real responsibility. The lack in modern education of a clear connection between learning and doing is responsible for much of the student actions that we have today. We asked what kind of people these are, and we put the sheriff of Greene County on the stand. We asked him question after question after question about those crimes of violence which are most typical, typically committed by young people today. Arson, looting, rape, etc., etc., etc. The sheriff gave these people a complete bill of health. They have never been known for the commission of crime. Dr. Littell, an authority in, in the history of the Amish people, has stated that they have not been known to have committed a felony in 250 years on this soil. They are a peaceable people and an asset in our society, not in terms of gross national product or the building of missiles, but certainly, but certainly in terms, but certainly in terms of the of the goodness that they afford as an example to the rest of our society. We placed the welfare director on the stand, the welfare director of Greene County, and we asked him whether the Amish take care of their old people, their dependent people. And the director of welfare testified that the Amish completely take care of themselves. They do not cast their burden on the community. They do not have people on relief or welfare. They do not have, they, they do not have uh, their aged in public homes for the aged. I think that what we are talking about here are really great achievers. They've been in the education business for 300 years. They're the finest natural farmers in the Western Hemisphere. You go up, members of the court, you go up to Lancaster County in Pennsylvania, and if you were to see these people, and see them in actuality, you would find young men who are heads of families and managers of large farms, experts in husbandry. You would find in their women, very model women, managers of households, very fine people. And I think that it's quite surprising that these people are singled out as not having an education, denying their people an education. For 300 years, these people have done superbly. 
For 300 years, these people have performed very well in our society. The question before the court, then, is whether the state may destroy, because that's what it will come to if these children are forced into high school, a peaceable, self-sustaining community, 250 years on this soil, on the ground that the parents in that community cannot send their children, on account of the clear mandate of their religion, to one or two years of high school. Mr. Justice Stewart and Brownfeld said that the Orthodox Jews in that case were faced with a cruel choice. A far crueler choice is presented in this case. If the decision is, of this court is against the Amish, I fear that many people will feel that this court has indicted our nation as too ossified, too brittle, too moribund to allow difference, innocent difference, to exist and to flourish in its midst. The Amish do not come here as fearful supplicants to this court. They come here with confidence, believing in this court as their brothers in justice, in love and goodness, and belief in constitutional liberty. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Mr. Calhoun, you have four minutes. Sir. Thank you. We have absolutely no quarrel with the Amish way of life. In fact, uh, to some of us, uh, in the remorseless daily crunch of living, the grass on the Amish side of the fence looks green, at much greener than ours at times. But I submit that retreat to a simpler era may have had some justification 200 years ago when Rousseau was extolling the virtues of the Cro-Magnon man, but that too much water has gone through the turbines for that kind of a position. What is needed is more education to cope with the problems of society, more pride in intellect, not less pride. This is what we should be developing in our uh, educational programs. The objection <clears throat> that the Amish have is to an additional two years, at this point, an additional two years uh, of education. And the people before the court here are Amish. But this, if this court does affirm this decision, it will apply to any number of years of education. There can be no uh, effort uh, or no uh, decision of this court, it seems to me, that can say eighth grade is the cutoff point. There is nothing uh, uh, logical or constitutional about the How can you say that, cutoff. Counsel? How can you say that in uh, such sweeping terms when for two or three hundred years in this country, primary education has been thought to be the eight uh, years uh, oh. in elementary, uh, seven or eight years in elementary schools. Yes, but it is, it, it is, yes, seven or eight, and now <clears throat> sixth grade is considered in some areas as elementary education. Seventh, eighth, and ninth are considered a middle school, and then they balance high school. In some areas, there is a junior high school. Uh, this is not so important as what is being taught is, is changing. The worldly courses of languages and uh, foreign languages and uh, uh, the institution of educational television into the elementary grades, these things are objectionable, you see. And the dynamic quality of education makes it very difficult to say and to administer a rule which says <clears throat> The eighth grade is the limit beyond which uh, anyone can be compelled to go to school. Well, haven't some very distinguished educators been very critical of the American system because it was concentrating on courses like interpersonal relations, community relations, etc., uh, with students who couldn't spell and read adequately yes. and write uh, by the time they got out of high school. May, may I suggest that that is true, that education uh, today is undergoing serious study and revision. 
that, uh, that many experts in the field have written uh, urging reform. And I think that this is necessary. I think that there should be organic involvement at the local level uh, in, in education, that we must uh, do this, but I think that what this court should be doing is to encourage that sort of thing, encourage the, the ferment and the change that's necessary to make education a viable institution. That's what this court needs. Thank you. Mr. Gallon, do you agree with Ms. Wall's statement that this is absolutely against the religion? to go to school beyond the elementary school. I don't agree with it fundamentally, no. Do you have anything in the record to contradict it? That, uh, yes, the, the trial court uh, found, uh, if you just bear with me, I'll find that uh, point. Well, if it's a finding, by the way, that the Supreme Court has uh, rejected, it doesn't, it won't help you very much, will it? Pardon? If it's a, one of the findings that the Supreme Court of the Wisconsin rejected, it won't help you very much. No, it I isn't. It isn't one of uh, what it uh, what it says is that uh, they didn't exactly uh, reject it, but they just didn't consider it. And it's this on page uh, 181 of the appendix. Obviously, in the long history of the sect, it existed in areas when and where there was no such thing as an eighth grade or even school systems of any kind. Just how the eighth grade cutoff point was arrived at was not explained. Age was apparently not the test, nor was the quality of the school system apparently a factor. Well, this is a memorandum decision by the circuit court. That's right. I, I want to know, is there any evidence, um, any testimony, any experts that contradicted the Amish experts? There, is, there was no expert testimony that contradicted the, the Amish testimony, except the testimony of the of the uh, state super of the uh, superintendent of the schools in uh, in uh, uh, Did he know the county. Did know about Amish law or Amish doctors? Yes, he did. He had he knew about Amish people. He was acquainted with Amish people. They lived down there. Well, you deny that it isn't a part of their faith that they should not go to public school beyond No, I, I deny I, I deny that it, it uh, I, I say this, that the trial court found that this did not interfere with their religious belief as such, but with their freedom to act, and that the freedom to act, uh, the restriction on the freedom to act here was a reasonable one which has been imposed uh, since 1642 in this country. That the compulsory school attendance is not uh, a, an, a, a law which uh, has just been recently uh, enforced. We've, we've had it since the, since the beginning of our educational system. Thank you, Mr. Calhoun. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ball. The case is submitted.